Welcome back to the second part of our interview with Obi Ebuna Jr., the son of the legendary Obi Ebuna, the writer and the political activist. In this part, we want to look at the life of Obi Ebuna Sr. as a political activist. Now, Obi, um, your father mm -hmm. did not just um, hide under art, as you said. Uh, mm -hmm. He participated. He went mm -hmm. into the arena and he fought. Mm -hmm. um, did he have any regrets and do you think that he had an impact on his writing career? Yes, but he, one of the people he was most fond of was Paul Robeson. And you remember Paul Robeson put his whole career on the line. And Paul Robeson eloquently stated, yet simplistically, the artist must elect to fight for freedom or slavery. Can't do both. So he had no regrets at all. And he recognized, I mean, after the success of Wind vs. Polygamy, later renamed Eliana, even that experience was bittersweet for him because that same, when they went to Senegal for that festival, as you know, that's one month before Osage for Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown by the CIA and British intelligence. So that 1966 was bittersweet for him. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned the uh, wind versus polygamy. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that, I think, was the first African uh, play produced in Britain or by the BBC? It was, it was the first play done on BBC television and radio which make it similar in distinction to Lorraine Hansberry being the first sister to have Raisin in the Sun on, the Broadway, on Broadway here, and we're gonna make a Pan-African link or connection there. So yeah, so it was very influential. But the moment the Biafran, Ibo Biafran War took place, him paying attention to the overthrow of Nkrumah, and him interacting with Walter Rodney, getting an overview of Guyana, him interacting with Tony Martin, having an uh, overview of what was going on in the Caribbean, him bringing Kwame Ture, then known as Stokely Carmichael, to uh, Britain, then being connected by Nkrumah. So he knew that um, the political activism, he was historically obligated to do that. Mm -hmm. So it never was a question of him flipping a coin, and if it landed on heads, he'd pursue his career as a writer. If it landed on tails, he'll deal with the political activism. He felt obligated to do both, and he did both to the best of his ability. Mm. Now you mentioned Kwame uh, Kure, uh, which um, I understand that he came to Britain to attend yes. a conference, mm -hmm. and that led to the formation of the Black Panther that, movement in, in Britain. Yes, it what did. role did your father play in that? He, they, won, they both won the panel, and he introduced Brother Kwame that night. But they both were connected to Osage for Kwame and Kroma and Shirley Graham Du Bois by that point. And right around that time, Shirley Graham Du Bois wanted my father to be a correspondent for the Afro-Asian Solidarity Bureau, which he was um, working with that was coming out of Peking in China. So um, the connection was there. Him and Kwame Ture maintained a friendship all the way um, to the end of their lives. Kwame Ture transitioning on November 15, 1998 and my father transitioning on January 20th of this year. And I thought it was interesting for the historical record to note, my father's born on the same day as Nelson Mandela, numerically, and he makes his transition the same day as the assassination of Emil Kakabra. Mm, interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, now um, you mentioned uh, Juan Kuruma. I wanted you to, to expand on, on that relationship. How is that, how did they uh, become close? Oh, well, I think what a lot of people don't understand is that in all actuality, Nkrumah is the father of black power. Let me explain. If the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey is the father of modern day African nationalism, if W.E.B. Du Bois is the father of modern day Pan-Africanism, Nkrumah gives us our first practical example of black power. So Nkrumah is not only the bridge between Du Bois and Garvey, He's not only the bridge between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, but he's the bridge between black power. And when he wrote his powerful essay, The Spectre of Black Power, where he mentioned my father and he mentioned another comrade of my father, Michael X, and he was the facilitator between the correspondence of Kwame Ture and my father, then it goes without saying. And the fact that my father looked at him, he considered him his patron and his saint. But even 12 years before the black power movement was embraced by the 1960s generation, it was none other than Richard Wright, who in 1954 wrote a book called Black Power, which is dedicated to Nkrumah. So Nkrumah is the bridge for the black power movement everywhere it existed in the world at that moment in history. So quite naturally, my father would feel 100% comfortable embracing him and adhering to him and following the example that he had began. Now, uh, your father championed the Pan-African movement. Where is that movement now uh, after 40-something years? 
Oh, it's well, it goes back to 1879 uh, when Henry Sylvester Williams in Trinidad first used the term. We're at the same place. I mean, we know that we take a look at even though our regional bodies, let's look at the continent of Africa. Northern Africa is the most isolated region. Southern Africa is the most stable region. Eastern Africa is the most chaotic. And yes, as much as it hurts me, but I have to be truthful, Western Africa has earned the distinction of being the most corrupt region. So even though our regional, we look at things on a regional level, and, and I think the most important thing when we look at Pan-Africanism, the way we're looking at it today, in the past, whenever you would use the term, people instinctively thought you meant the continent, but it means the diaspora as well. So I think that we have to take a look at the issues that have the most Pan-African scope and character. So that could be reparations, that could be our fight against HIV AIDS, and in my personal opinion, the issues that have the most Pan-African potential are Zimbabwe and Cuba, without question. Mm -hmm. Now, in a recent interview, you said that your father saw the liberation and unification of the African continent as the key to the political and economic and cultural empowerment of Africans at home and abroad. Yes. Now, was he frustrated that such liberation and unification has not happened? No. Uh, yeah. Christians still waiting for Jesus. We know things take time. <laughs> so we're fine. We, um, him and Kwame Ture both taught me that it's a privilege to witness victory. We have many accounts and narratives of some of the free greatest freedom fighters of the highest order doing so much to liberate our people in certain pockets, but not witnessing the final victory. The man who led the guerrilla war in Zimbabwe, Josiah Mangama Tongo Gara, he didn't get to see Zimbabwe's flag raised. He died in a car crash from Maputo, the capital of Mozambique, back to Harare. When we look at the slave narratives, Nat Turner didn't live to see child of slavery end. So, I mean, we, we, we understand that. That comes with the territory. We'll just do as much as we can in the space and time we occupy this planet. And as long as we know we did as much as we could and every contribution we made, we genuinely seek to maximize potential, we can live comfortable. Mm. Now, let's talk about what you are currently doing. Um, mm -hmm. You compiled some music recently uh, mm -hmm. called uh, Battle Cry for... Cuba and Zimbabwe. Yes. Um, with MI. The, M1. M1, the, the uh, musical from one of the musical group from members. The internationally the, acclaimed hip hop group Dead Press. Yeah, Dead Press. And many yeah. of your listeners are all too familiar with them. So, so yeah, you, you did that in support of Cuba and Zimbabwe. Yes. Can you tell our viewers more about, about that project? Well, the project is aimed, it took us three years to do the first album, but our listeners know things take time. So, um, the objective is to bring artists from all over the world to develop music and poetry calling for the immediate lifting of United States European Union sanctions on Zimbabwe and the U.S. blockade on Cuba. The U.S. blockade on Cuba has existed since the Kennedy administration imposed it in 1962 after the failed U.S. Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961 and in relationship to Zimbabwe, the Zimbabwe Democracy and Economic Recovery Act of 2001 is the United States' vindictive response to the land historic land reclamation program in Zimbabwe, where 4,500 Caucasian far commercial farmers, the land was reclaimed, not seized. We can't seize what belongs to us. And it was reclaimed by 350,000 indigenous Zimbabwean families, where the average family comprises of six people, which hopefully serves as a catalyst for all these African nations that now realize that flag independence was just scratching the surface. It's just the tip of the iceberg. Now, you cover United States for a newspaper in Zimbabwe. U.S. policy. Um, how, do you, how do you report the news, different from how the international media huh? reports the news they send to Africa? For instance, if someone is watching CNN uh -huh. and someone is reading what you wrote, what would be the difference? I'm going to let them read <laughs> and make that decision. We've never trusted um, BBC. We've never trusted CNN. We certainly haven't trusted the Voice of America. And what that's done, even in the tradition of writing, Richard Wright did journalism at one point. Julian Mayfield did journalism at one point. And if we go through the Pantheon, many of our great writers um, dibbled. Shirley Graham Du Bois was a journalist of the highest order. So I'm only following in their footsteps. And the biggest challenge right now is to defend the sovereignty of Zimbabwe because we've helped many 
um, anti-colonial movements come to power, but we've never been able to help one stay in power. And I think that in the spirit of evolution, of Pan-African resistance and our movement. We have to do everything we can, and this is why we tell everybody that Zimbabwe must become for Africans what Palestine is for Arabs, what Cuba is for what people call Hispanics, and what Bolivia is for indigenous people. We must rally around Zimbabwe no matter where we are, and part and parcel of that is getting those sanctions lifted, because I don't think we pay attention to the impact of diplomatic terrorism. We're still focusing on conventional warfare, bombs, guns, planes, etc., etc., etc. But the ink pen is the number one threat to the human being when in the hands of our former colonial masters, when they can't control the direction of a particular leader. Now, you cover your report for Zimbabwean newspaper. What do you think will happen after Robert Mugabe is, uh, is, is, is no longer in power? Well, I don't want to be like a meteorologist that gives the wrong weather forecast, but I think because the people have embraced the land program, remember they used to say, the New York Times and so many others, that the land only went to cronies, but we now know that 65% of the farming done outside of Harare, and the only 1.5 million people there, 65% of the farming in places like Kwe Kwe, Kodoma, Mandorangezi are done by women. So we feel that that's going to be impactful. And um, the fact that they now have 25% of the world's diamond reserves. And so we're going to finally deal with this issue of how the human resource, the most precious resource of all, properly utilizes the material resources for the benefit of all of us. And I think that it also addresses the issue that Nkrumah and Sekutere used to address all the time, which was the brain drain, that in spite of the hunger, in spite of the poverty, in spite of the war, the fact that our best architects, best doctors, best lawyers, best writers work elsewhere, not at home where they belong, I think that a program that has such an aggressive emphasis on self-determination automatically challenges us to, ask, to answer the most fundamental question of all. What should determine our patriotism, our history and our culture, or our passport and our birth certificates? Now, uh, I wanted to ask you, have you talked to, have you interviewed uh, uh, the President Mugabe before? No, for strategic reasons, but I interview him every time I go and every year at the United Nations, I interview his spokesperson, Mr. George Chamba. And I interviewed uh, the former Prime Minister Shangri before. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and um, they wouldn't let me have a one-on-one -on -one interview with him. I had to share it with the Times of London, and I had to share it with um, NPR. NPR. But yeah, so no, but I've had the honor and privilege of meeting President Mugabe on two different occasions, and he said that his message for Africans in the diaspora is this. Don't focus on assassinations and coup d'etats on the African continent. Focus on the energy put in isolating a country, making them vulnerable to a coup and assassination. Mm -hmm. And I think if we re do take that approach, then we'll say that good luck Jonathan must answer to all of Africa for his role in the assassination of Muammar Gaddafi. Now, um, you, um, when, you look at, um, when you look at Africa, mm -hmm. especially today, yes. and the crisis across Africa, mm -hmm. especially the Islamic uh, insurgents in many parts of Africa, like mm -hmm. in Nigeria, in, in Kenya. Mm -hmm. what, what is, how do you factor it into the whole Pan-African movement? That um, our struggle is along political lines. Um, we're not going to let them manipulate to um, believe systems that are not indigenous to us anyway. How are we going to be divided along those lines? Muslims don't kidnap children. Christians don't take on slaves. No true Muslim could have been involved in the slave trade. No true Muslim Christian can be involved in the slave trade. No Christian or Muslim can embrace colonialism or neo-colonialism. And as long as we keep focus on that, we'll, and remember, my father wor worked for a Muslim, a man who happened to be Muslim, Mutala Muhammad. And that never was an issue. So good luck Jonathan is being used to start a religious war in Africa. And we must let him know that the Bible or Quran, even though they give people spiritual upliftment, they are not a good enough reason for to continue to contribute to the raping and plundering of the African continent. And anyone who attempts to use religion to divide us, we're going to make them pay. 
And um, just like we see what's going on in Gaza today, what's going on in Palestine, the Palestinian people are not going to use, let the Israelis continue to commit crimes against humanity in the name of Judaism. We're not going to let anyone, especially our former colonial and slave masters, continue to try to use religion, especially not indigenous to Africa, use that as a pretext to continue to maintain their relationship to Africa, which is a relationship of rape, plunder, and militarism and genocide. Now, um, when Obama came into power, there mm. was an, a, a, a hope that there could be a change in America's approach to Africa. But apparently that did not happen. No. And you've been very critical of Obama mm -hmm. in some of your uh, videos. What is your take on, on his approach to Africa? Um, he, he's maintained, he's taken the same traditional approach. Um, during his first administration, Johnny Carson was his assistant secretary to African affairs who is the highest ranking um, African to serve in the National Intelligence Council. When Truman created the CIA, he tr created the National Intelligence Council to give them strategic direction. His current um, advisor, um, his security advisor is Susan Rice, who got her doctorate on um, Zimbabwe, who um, was the biggest advocate for AFRICOM when she was working for the Brookings Institute. And her and Condoleezza Rice, even though they have different, one is a Democrat, one is a Republican, they're both disciples of Madeleine Albright. That's why we say that a permanent staple of Madeleine Albright's political diet is brown rice. So one of the things that we understand is these are the people who guide him. And even like in relationship to Zimbabwe, Joe Biden is a co-sponsor of the Zimbabwe Democracy and Economic Recovery Act. John Kerry is. Hillary Clinton is. His U.S. ambassador to Botswana, a Caucasian woman named Michelle Gavin, when she was a fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations, she wrote a paper called Planning for Post Mugabe Zimbabwe. You see what he did in Libya. He has no respect for Africa anyway, and the last I checked, you wouldn't go to Hawaii or Indonesia to learn African history anyway. So he doesn't have any appreciation for Africa. He doesn't have any respect for Africa. When he was, um, when he spoke in 2004, the first time we saw him, what did he say? Only in the United States is his story possible. So that must mean that Nkrumah and Sekouture and Patrice Lumumba are figments of our imagination. They didn't exist. If it's only in the United States that an African can preside over a government. Now, next month, African heads of states will come to Washington to meet with Obama. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that Mugabe is not coming. Of course not. Now, so what do you think about such, such, a, such a meeting? Well, I mean, uh, we once again, we know how he feels about Africa. He bombs Libya. And, so that re and remember what he said during his first inauguration. He said the might of the U.S. military must be matched by the strength of its diplomacy. So that gives them a chance to be terrorist and on a multifaceted level. So you bomb Libya for seven months in a row, so you deal with the militaristic aspect. And then every year that you're in office, you sign an executive order to maintain the sanctions against Zimbabwe. And he wrote Bush a letter when he was a senator in 2007 that said, don't lift the sanctions on Zimbabwe till the dark cloud of Robert Mugabe has been ousted from power. And um, when the inclusive government first came here five years ago to re-engage the West, he let everyone in the, in the Oval Office except the representative of ZANU-PF. And I broke the story to the world. So no, I mean, when it comes to Africa, he considers Africa the playground of the West, just like Bush did, just like Carter did, just like Clinton did. And our people are going to realize that. And as a matter of fact, lastly on this subject, um, 48 hours before his first victory, um, the outgoing Assistant Secretary for African Affairs, Jendai Frazier, met with all the African ambassadors. And she told them, "Don't. we know that some of you think that there's going to be a change in Africa policy. You're going to be surprised. And as we see, there is no change at all. He sees Africa as foreign policy, and he sees it as a playground of the West. But it's going to lead to his demise and how he's looked at in history. Um, one last question, we are really out of time. Sure. Uh, your Tita Company, Mass Emphasis Children's mm -hmm. History and Tita Company, has produced eight plays, mm -hmm. uh, one of which is in, remembra in remembrance of Kwam Krumah and Thomas Sankara. Yes. Uh, what do you intend to achieve with this theater company? To use theater as a vehicle to teach our kids our history. When we take a look at our movement, in the 1950s, our main instrument of protest was the courts. Then we went to the streets. 
Then when we went nonviolently, then when they inflicted terrorism on us, we burnt down 289 cities in defense of our communities here. So, and then for the last 40, oh, nearly 50 years, the vote has been the main instrument and it's resulted in a president who looks like us physically and over 600 mayors. So there's time for a new movement and we believe that that's the African history reclamation movement where we're leaving no stones unturned. And all of the attempts to hide our history, the insidious attempts, they're going to fall short and we're going to expose these youth to our history. We believe that the human resource is the most valuable resource and they will be the generation that takes our struggle to new unprecedented heights because we're taking this approach. Not necessarily because of the approach of mass emphasis as a company, but mass emphasis is part and parcel of a movement so much bigger that will have so much monumental impact on the masses of our people at home and abroad. All right. Thank you so much, Obi, for My pleasure for, for us. being here, and I hope this that is. this engagement between us met the Welcome satisfaction of you as a host no, yeah, and your listeners. Of course, of course. They, they, it's, it's wonderful. Thank and you so thank much. you so much for the brilliant article you wrote on my father. Thank you. When we come back, we are going to show you more of our programs, so stay tuned. <laughs>